Well, well, well. Good morning. Good morning. Isn't it amazing and, uh, uh, that we have an opportunity to worship God as we finish today uh, this uh, last series that is called A New Beginning? We're going to talk a little bit about the new birth. Uh, so it's just amazing to be able to share something that will bring change into our life. Before we seat or are seated, I wanted to read uh, the portion of scripture for today. It's in John chapter 3. Uh, verses uh, 1 uh, to 3, and it's going to show up on the screen, and it says as this, There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would do amazing things in our hearts. For those who do not know you, for those who are here for the first time, who are watching us through the internet for the first time at their homes, we pray that the Holy Spirit will convince them, Father, in the direction that you're leading them, Father, for those who already know you, Father, may your Holy Spirit just bring transformation, bring change, so that we will come out of here completely different to how we walked into this worship hall. We pray this and ask this in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. You may be seated. I don't know if you ever asked the question, if you ever asked, what is the difference between being aware and the word know or knowing? If you never thought about that, aware is more of something that you perceive. It's more uh, something of what you're being conscious about. It is something that is learned. And the opposite, on the other hand, uh, to know, it is something that is basically a relational term. It is a little bit more deeper than that. It is more intimate. It is more personal. It is more relational. And the point about this is, uh, you know, we can be able to be aware of something and not know it. We can be aware of something and not know exactly what it is. For example, we could be aware of the moon. In other words, we can be aware of where it's located. We can have a lot of information about the moon without knowing the moon personally. And here's the dilemma for many. Because it is very possible that we can be aware of Jesus without knowing Jesus. You might be asking, how is it, Pastor, that we can be aware of Jesus without knowing Jesus? Well, that's exactly what we're going to find out today through this passage that we read today in John. And, and we're, we have like two thoughts that we want to share. And these two thoughts are going to help us understand how or why is it that many people can be aware of Jesus without knowing Jesus personally? So if you like to take notes, if you're at home and you like to take out a piece of paper and a pen and take some notes, or if you want to use your phones and just take some notes on your phone, um, here is the first thought for today. It's on the screen, and it reads as follows. We are all aware of something about Jesus. We, you and I, are all aware of something about Jesus. Let's go back to our guiding text, John chapter 3, starting in verse 1. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know. In other words, we, what he's trying to say is that we are all aware. We are all conscious that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. So Nicodemus belonged to a group of Pharisees that were religious leaders. And, and these religious leaders were very wealthy. Uh, they, they, they loved the law. They were very experts in, in theology. 
And what happens is that they depended on the law. They depended on good works to be in good standing with God. They depended on the law and they taught that they could enter the kingdom of God by obeying the law, by doing good works. We have this guy called Nicodemus who comes and walks up to Jesus. He wants to talk to Jesus from teacher to teacher, from rabbi to rabbi, from one man to another man. And he's, he's coming representing a group of people that are saying we are aware of Jesus. We're conscious of Jesus. We have perceived that there's someone who's doing some miracles and wonders. So we are perceiving that he's coming from God. We have learned from seeing the wonders and signs that you must come from God. But there's one thing that happens when someone is approaching Jesus. When someone comes and is looking for Jesus, there's something that happens. That's something that we need to know. And if you were writing or taking notes, write as letter A. When you're coming to see Jesus, when you're looking for Jesus, Jesus is always aware of what you really know about him. Jesus is always aware of what you really know about him. Let's go back to John 3.3. 3. Jesus replied, I tell you the what? I tell you the truth. In other words, Jesus always knows what's in your heart when you are approaching Jesus. Jesus always knows what you have in stock, what's in your heart, what's your passion, what are you thinking about when you are approaching. And he knew what Nicodemus was longing in his heart. He knew the questions that Nicodemus had in his heart to the point that the text tells us that Jesus replied. He replied to Nicodemus before he even asked a question. Nicodemus did not ask a question, and Jesus replied to him. And he replied by saying, I tell you the truth. In other words, Jesus had food of truth to feed Nicodemus, some truth that he needed to know in order to enter the kingdom of God. He's trying to tell Nicodemus, Nico, Nico, you are aware of a lot, but know very little. You are aware of a lot, Nico, but you know very little. And this poses a dilemma for many. Because many of us, many people, give more importance to being aware about God, by being conscious about God, about perceiving something about God, but really not knowing about God. And what happens to that is that eventually, what's going to happen, and we will see it through the message, that we start developing some type of pride in our hearts. And what that does is that it draws us farther and farther away from knowing Jesus, even though we are aware of Jesus himself. So maybe the question, the question that we should be asking is, what characterizes a person who aims at being aware of Jesus and not knowing Jesus. What is the characteristic of a person that wants to be more and more aware of Jesus and not know Jesus? Well, in your notes, write as letter B. Expectations. Expectations is what characterizes someone who aims of being aware without knowing. And here's the point. We have an expectation for everything that we do in life. We have an expectation that God needs to explain why he does when he does it, why he allows what he allows. There's something in us that we feel that God owes us an explanation. And we start asking God, but God, why is it that I can't change to another job? God, why is it that I have to stay stuck in this marriage? God, why are my finances like this when that other person is different? God, why did you take my son? God, why am I sick like this if I've served you for so many years? 
Why, God? When, God? For what, God? And we start questioning God. And maybe, maybe there is a question. But it's not a question that we ask God. It's a question that maybe God is asking. It's a question that maybe we need to ask ourselves. And here it is. Why is it that we treat God that way? Why is it we treat God the way we've talked about? You want to know the answer? Here's the answer. Because we treat God as if he were an elected president. And that he's accountable to us. Instead of seeing God as the sovereign God that he is, we bring God from his throne in heaven and bring him down where I can talk to him face to face. Where I can question him. Where I, I can ask him everything I need to ask. Where I can interview him before I decide to obey. Where I bring him to a, a, a position where I feel comfortable and asking him what I want. But not because I really want to find out. It's because I want to make sure that I am in control. And that is exactly what Nicodemus is doing in this scene. He's walking up to Jesus Man to man, teacher to teacher, rabbi to rabbi, human to human, to ask him questions, not because he's really interested in knowing the answer, it's because he's been aware of Jesus, and he just wants to add to his collection of awareness for a personal reason rather than a godly reason. And maybe, maybe this is just the attitude that you might have towards God. Maybe that's the way you address God. You're basically asking God, God, before I move in the direction that you're asking me to move, before I do this step of obedience, before I do this with my marriage, before I do this with my finance, before I do this with church, before I serve, before this or that, God, I need some clarification. I need some more information. And I end up making awareness of God or conscious of God or information of God more important than knowing God himself. And what that does to your heart and to my heart is that we are filled with Pride. Because the more we want to be aware, there's going to get a moment, there's going to get a season in my life that I'm going to feel that I have enough awareness of God that I don't need to go to God anymore because I'm self-aware that I don't need Him anymore. And what happens is that whatever I admired of God, I have no more admiration for God. And I start to admire myself. I start to admire what I know. I start to admire what I have acquired. I start to admire the creation and not the creator. I start admiring myself and other people. Let me give you an illustration of what I mean with all this. I don't know if you ever, when you were a kid, we were invited to birthday parties as kids. And in many of those houses, we had um, a magician. They, they brought in a magician to do some illusions, some tricks with cards or with animals, and we enjoyed them. And as we were growing up with kids, we started doing the same thing. We became aware of a magician. We became aware that it was really a trick. We became aware that he was trying to do something that he really couldn't do. There was a trick behind that. And then when we went to parties, we actually were not focused and enjoying the party, enjoying the magician, and enjoying the event. What we wanted to is we wanted to discover the trick. And guess what? We would look at the magician and, and we would wait and wait. And then finally we saw where he missed the mark. We saw what he was doing. And we would shout, look, look, the card is under his sleeve. The card is under the hat. We would do that. And what would happen at that moment is that we had discredit the magician. We had the magician here, we had the magician, we thought he was a great guy, he did things that were amazing, and we were stunned by it, we were like, oh my God, this is amazing, but then we have brought the magician to our level, and even, we probably brought the magician 
to the floor. And what happened in our hearts is that we felt proudful. It was filled with pride. Why? Because now we thought that we were better than the magician. We, we knew how he did the trick. As a matter of fact, we probably thought, if I do the trick, I will never get caught. I can do it better. I could do it better. And, and my dear friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ, whoever is watching us via internet, that might be your case. And that's how we may be treating God. We, we, it happens that we have been seeking more to be aware of God than into spending time in knowing God. So our heart is filled with pride. We have our heads big with awareness. We have our heads uh, you know, full with wisdom and, and all this information and capacities and potentials. But our hearts are so small because pride shrinks a heart. Pride is all inward and it shrinks the heart. So instead of approaching God with humility, we approach God with this attitude. With this attitude that communicates something to God. God, medicine has discovered your trick regarding the human body. <laughs> God, science has discovered your trick regarding hurricanes. God, we're in the process of discovering so many tricks that you have that before I can move forward to do what you want, before I can obey you in this field, before I can, you know, save my marriage, before I can do something regarding my finances, I, I need some more information. I need some more clarification. I need to, uh, you know why? Because there's a moment that as, if I keep being aware, I'm pretty sure that as we discover this trick about medicine and we discover this trick about hurricane, we're going to discover all your tricks. And guess what, God? We're not going to need you. We're not going to need you because we have been self-aware of that. We're not going to need you. And, and we're going to come up with our own tricks. We're going to come up with doing our own will. How about that, God? And maybe this is your attitude. Maybe if you're watching this online, maybe you're thinking, oh, my God, that's my attitude towards God. And it might be. As a matter of fact, this is what Nicodemus came about. This was Nicodemus' attitude. He came to Jesus, and he was basically saying, Jesus, I know your tricks. We are aware of your signs and wonders and miracles. We are aware of the road that leads to God. We are aware of what the law has to say about it. We are aware that about good works and good deeds. We are aware of this. We are aware of that. So Jesus, I'm coming here representing many that just want to know what's our next step. We just want to know what's our next step because we just want to add to what we already have. We want to add to what we are already aware of. We want to get the last information directly. We, we know you're coming from heaven, from God. So this is like an email. You're like an email from God letting us know what's the next step. What is the next thing that I have to be aware of? That's why I'm knocking on your door. Nicodemus would say, understanding that this is a paraphrase of what we just read. So, my friends, we could get to be aware. We all are aware of something of God. Our first thought summarizes this. We are all aware of something about Jesus. But not necessarily that means that we all know the Jesus. That drives us to our second thought. Right, number two, if you're taking notes, it's going to show up on the screen. Thought number two, we all do not know. We all do not know the truth of what we are aware of. John 3, 3 says, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus longed to be part of the kingdom of God. Nicodemus longed to be saved. 
Nicodemus longed to be a justified man. Nicodemus longed to have eternal life. Nicodemus longed to be a defender of the word of God, to be a defender of the law of God, to be a defender of good works. Nicodemus longed, and maybe you're longing here the same way as Nicodemus longed, but in, in Nicodemus' case, he longed for this, and he was convinced, my dear friends, he was convinced that he had been doing that all his life as a teacher for the Jewish people, as a teacher for the nation of Israel. He was, conv he was convinced that whatever he was aware of was enough. He was convinced that whatever he was aware of up to that moment was enough. But as we just read, he did not know the truth of what he was aware of. So Jesus has to come and tell him. He reads his mind. He reads his heart. I tell you the truth. And in other versions of the Bible, that just means truly, truly, I tell you. In other words, Nicodemus you are doubly, twicely wrong about your interpretation of life, about entering the kingdom of God. Because works are not sufficient, are not enough. Because Judaism is not enough, it's not sufficient. Because your religion, as it is, it's not enough. And what Jesus is going to do, do at that moment, he's going to tell Nico. Nico, I tell you the truth. In order to enter the kingdom of God, you must see the kingdom of God first. You, you, you must, you know, I tell you that unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. But the problem, Nico, is that you are blinded. Because the devil has blinded your mind, has blinded your understanding. You do not understand. You cannot discern. You know, you cannot visualize in your spirit the message of the gospel because the devil has blinded and you cannot distinguish light from darkness, spiritual from physical. You cannot see what is spiritual with your heart as it is right now. And if you can't see the kingdom of God, then you cannot even enter the kingdom of God. And Jesus is going to Go ahead and illustrate that. He's going to take Nico because he's a teacher. So I want to take you a little bit further down the line and kind of illustrate this for you. You're taking notes right as letter eight. Jesus refers to a spiritual kingdom. And before we go and enter into what Jesus is explaining, let me take you to a very simple definition of what the kingdom of God is because we want to understand what is and what is not part of the kingdom of God. And Paul does an amazing job in defining the essence of what is and what is not the kingdom of God. Romans 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not, kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. In other words, it's not a physical kingdom, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. It is a spiritual kingdom intangible kingdom when he refers to the kingdom of God. Now, let's go back to where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus about all this. John chapter 3, verse 5 now. Jesus answered, truly, truly. Amen, amen. I say this to you, unless. Say that word with me, unless. Unless someone is born of water and the spirit, he cannot. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. So, so far, Jesus had kind of said the same thing in two different ways, but he's actually said the same thing. First, he says, you cannot see the kingdom of God unless you are born again. And now he says, you cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you're born of water and the Spirit. So, it's a, it's a game of words he's using there to mean the same thing. Here's what we can deduce. Here's the conclusion. Here's what we can summarize this. It's going to show up on the screen, and I wrote it down because it's easier if you read it. And I'm going to read it for you. Whatever is new about this birth, right? 
whatever is new about this birth, it is related to water and spirit, to this dynamic duo called water and spirit. And whatever, whatever the water and spirit represent, they can only be something spiritual because Jesus is only talking about the kingdom of God, which we have defined to be fully what? Spiritual. So this is what he's saying to Nico. He said, Nico, whatever new means in this new birth, it is not something you already did. It is not something you already have. It is not something you are bringing. It is not something that is physical, but it is entirely, completely something new, and it's related to water and to spirit. And whatever those two elements mean, they don't have nothing to do with you, but they have totally all to do with God. So he's clarifying this because, see, in, in Nico's mind, he was bringing something that he can supply to that. He was thinking, I need to bring something. He was thinking in works. He was thinking in all something physical. So Jesus says, let me even clarify that a little bit deeper, Nico, for you. He goes down to John 3, 6. Humans can only reproduce only human life. But the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. In other words, your human life, your human body, the fact that your mom, your mom's water uh, broke and splashed out water when you were born, the fact that you were baptized or not baptized, the fact that you follow or don't follow the law, the fact that you do or not do good works, whatever that is that you're bringing to the scene that we're talking, Nico, it means nothing to the new birth because it has nothing to do with you and it has all to do with God. Are we clear, Nico? Nico must be like, hmm. So, Jesus cont continues to explain, and we can see that in John 3, 7 through 8. So, Nico, don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so you can't explain. Nico, you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. Because Nico, in his human effort, tried to explain what he had just heard from Jesus. Uh, Jesus, does it mean, let me explain back to you. Let me, let me paraphrase Jesus, what you just said, what I understand, and I'm going to go ahead and teach that in my set, next Sunday class, said, Nico, what I'm understanding is that then a person has to go back to their mother's womb, right? I get it. Jesus is saying, you've been a teacher all your life and don't get this? You can't understand. Let me, let me explain it to you because you cannot explain it. Just as the wind blows wherever it wants because the wind has its own will, the Holy Spirit that produces the new birth produces the new birth according to its will whenever it wants. Uh -oh. Also, we cannot be aware of. Nico, I know that you love to be aware. You're coming here with a lot of awareness. You have a whole bag carrying of awareness. You, you like to be aware, but you, we cannot be aware of the moment the Spirit produces this spiritual generation, this, this new birth, in the same way that you cannot know when the Spirit, or when the, actually the wind blows. You cannot. And finally, Nico, the same way that you cannot cause the wind to blow. There's nothing that you can do to cause the wind to blow. There's nothing that you can do to cause the new spiritual birth. Are we good, Nico? Are we understanding, Nico? Are, have we settled this situation that you came to ask? Have I answered all your questions? And we probably know that from reading the whole context that Nico walked away with all that information. Not necessarily knowing Jesus, but being more aware of him. So now that we have understood for our benefit, let's go back and understand what does this water and spirit 
have to do? What does it mean? Because I'm pretty sure that you're interested in understanding what does it mean because I've read this so many times and I want to check it out on my checklist and completely finally understand it. Write as letter B in your notes. Let's discover the spiritual birth truth about being born of water and of the spirit. Let's take the easy route. The spirit is the easy part of that equation, of that dynamic duel. The spirit is God's spirit who's active in salvation, who's active in giving this, the, the, the spiritual life to my spirit, my spirit, humanity spirit, comes to this earth dead, means separated from a relationship with God. They need to know God. We need to know God. We're going to talk that, about that a little bit later. But the spirit basically is the life-giving portion of that dual or dynamic dual of spirit and water. That's the easy part. But what is the water? See, we've already seen that it cannot be something physical. It has to be something spiritual. And we understand from this passage that there's only two elements, two ingredients that are part of that. There's only two. Jesus doesn't name three or four. I'll give you a couple of them later. He says there's water and there's spirit. We've already taken care of the spirit. What is the water? But the amazing thing about the word of God is that you can compare scripture with scripture and find out wherever in other place God is talking about the new birth and that element or those elements. Let's go then to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. For you have been, what? Born again. Oh, we got born again. Now, let's look for those two elements, right? We have been born again. How? Oh, it says, not of seed. And I'll talk about that seed in a little, in a little second. Not of, of, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. But we're getting a clue there. But let's go to another verse, and there's many of these. I just took two of them. James 1.18. The exercise of his will. Remember that the, the wind blew according to his will. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, worked according to their will. It says here, in the exercise of his will, he gave us birth. How? By the word of truth. My dear friends, my brothers in Christ, for those who are watching us through the internet, the water refers to the word of God that acts as a cleansing, purifying agent for God. Consider this. When a physical baby is conceived... There are two elements that are, need to be there. The egg and the sperm. The egg and the seed. In the same way, in a spiritual uh, birth, there has to be two elements. The spirit and the word of God. The spirit and the water. The spirit and the seed. And we just saw that the seed is the incorruptible word of God. So to be born again has nothing to do with us. It is a spiritual event that has all to do with God, and it is based on the birth of having the Spirit and the Word of God. Amen to that? Okay, you can check that off your list now. Go ahead. Last thing, let us see. What are the traits to see in a born-again person? How can I kind of say and see and understand if that's a born-again? How can I see if I'm a born-again person? Number one is love for Jesus and others. You have this love for Jesus and others. Why? Because God has poured all his love in us. Romans 5.5 5 says the following. You'll see it in the screen. Because the love of God has been what? Poured out within our hearts through what? The spiritual. Through the Holy Spirit. Ah, the same spirit that was present during my spiritual birth. Yeah, that same guy. Through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And, and how do I squeeze that love out of my heart? If it's already there, the whole potential of God's love is already there in your heart. But you need to squeeze it out. God says in Galatians 5.22 that the fruit of the Spirit is what? It begins with what? Love. So the more dependent that your life is on God's Holy Spirit... That love that is already deposited is going to come from the inside 
to the outside to love God and to love others. So that's one of the traits that you're a born-again person. A second trait, a desire for holiness. You got a new life. You're a new creation. You're a new person. You have a, it's completely, it's not that they fix you, it's that you're totally a new creation and you have a new nature. And that new nature is according to God, not according to Adam, but according to Jesus. And that desires your holiness. It desires the following. 1 Peter 1.16. You shall be holy, for I am. And that's why, you know, a new person, a newborn person wants that holiness. And the last is that you have this desire to give testimony. John himself wrote in his epistles that, you know, that we have the testimony in us. C-I-U, Christ in us, our hope of glory, it's in us. Then the testimony of God, Jesus wants to just live through us. And we want to show our neighbors, our spouses, our, our, the people who we live, everyone. Jesus wants to say, I want to show who I am to them. But listen to this. In a physical birth, a baby shows that he's alive by crying. When the wind blows, you can hear the wind blow. You can't see it. In other words, there has to be some type of effect going out from your insight because you have Christ in you. Three traits. Love, holiness, and testimony. So, in summary, we have seen God's intent today of bringing closer heaven and earth, of closing the gap between heaven and earth. And He has shown us that there is nothing from this earth. There's nothing physical. There's no finances. There's no law. There's no good works. There's no good marriage. There's no good deeds. There's no good nothing that can contribute to closing that gap. And that's where Jesus runs in, does not waste his time, and says, you need to be born again from water and spirit. And it's not just that God wants to fix an arm, God wants to fix a leg, or kind of fix, he wants a completely new creation. So the question might be, how does that all start? Well, to be born again is not a step that I can take. It's not that I, you follow. Jesus never told Nicodemus, well, you need to take one, two, three steps and you will be born again. No, see, it's entirely depending on God. But where does it start on our side? And we're going to see that a little bit more next week when we, we study a little bit of John 3.16. You're going to get an idea from there. But here's the thing. It starts when we understand our condition in God's eyes, that we are sinners in need of a Savior, that we need Jesus because the wages of sin is death. So we need a Savior. We need to come. We can be aware and aware. We can, you can walk out today seeing this message online. You can walk here online. You can be more aware. But being aware without knowing is absolutely worthless. But it might be that you're like in a football game. You're, you're, you're advancing 10 yards and 10 more yards. And maybe the touchdown is salvation. But it means that there comes a moment in your life that you realize that you have a lot of awareness in your awareness bag. And you need to transition from being aware to believing. You need to be taking a step from just saying, I'm aware to, I trust in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. See, Nicodemus walked out of that conversation with Jesus with his bag full of awareness. But we noticed what we understand. Theologians say that he accepted probably Jesus about a year and after, almost towards his death. He, he defended him, but at the end when he shows up during his, after his crucifixion that he wanted to take and help with the body and bury it, it shows that he was willing to risk. When you are a newborn believer, you're willing to die for Jesus. And he was willing to be dead by the other Pharisees when he was taking Jesus' body. The question might be, what is stopping you from making that transition from awareness to believing. 
But I can tell you something. Whatever that is holding you, it cannot save you. It is, cannot be bigger than what Jesus already did on the cross. So my encouragement today, today is the day that you take all that awareness and you take all that together and put it in your hands of faith and trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Amen? So if you're ready to do that, if you're online and ready to do that, I'm going to guide you through a model prayer 